Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Have you ever met someone who could just pick up an instrument and play as if they have had years of experience? Micah Barnes tells Scott what it was like to be in a band in Nashville, what led him to a career in graphic design, as well as what brought him back home to West Tennessee. I'm Scott Williams. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, where every week we explore the culture the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee, just like we do every single day here at our museum and Heritage Park in Union City. I have an extra creative special guest today with Micah Barnes, who joins us. He is an artist, illustrator, photographer, musician. He is one of the most creative people I know here in Northwest Tennessee, and he also brought his brother-in-law and sister who had such a great time when we did their podcast that they've come to join him during his welcome micah thanks for having me so um (laughs) tell me uh, first of all i want to go back to the beginning tell me about little micah okay and you're obviously now you're super creative you're doing all kinds of fun things how did all that get started how far back do you want me to go? All to the beginning. The beginning? To the womb. I was born in a small town. <laughs> uh, my roommate, one of my many roommates uh-huh. here in, uh, what, 72, grew up here close to Real Foot Lake out in what we call the Dixie community. And, uh, yeah, went to, you know, did the what you expect around here, went to the, the local school, local high school, went off to college. Now, uh, were you were you one of the kids who were, were you like duck hunting and no, or were you a little no. bit more of a creative kid I w- from I the was, beginning? I was an indoors kind of person. Can I interject yeah. one thing? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I, I have to share this. So, Micah's bedroom when he was a child, and I don't know how long this lasted. Do y'all remember the game Mousetrap? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was Micah's room. There were gadgets on the walls. Uh, even as, even as a little kid, as a he child, was, so I had to interject that. Uh, you can have yeah, that. no, that's that. Yeah. It's always good to have a sister interjecting yeah. a family member. <laughs> also, if you start to, if you start right. to lie, uh-huh. you know, yeah, she'll right. call right. you on it. Yeah, well, yeah. Essentially, my life has continued to be one big Rube Goldberg machine. So <laughs> that's, that's what it is. So, so you were raised near here, yes, Real, Real Foot correct. Lake, yes. in a in a culture where people are, you know, a lot of duck hunting going yes. on, and but yeah. you didn't really jive I with carried. that. Nothing for it. Okay. So, and so no you went to high school? I, yeah, I did over here at Central. They, when I was at Central, um, I'd started, uh, I, I guess, my uh, initial real foray into music and arts and stuff. I, I started playing guitar. I My senior year at school there, I was in the, uh, the band, but I was in the marching band helping the color guard to get out of uh, study hall. I'd never, I couldn't find something to... <laughs> To do, and they put me in a study hall. I'm like, well, this this is no good. And then the band director walks in, and says, "Hey, we need help, like anything to get me out of here." So I helped out the color guard. So I spent half the year helping the color guard. Anyhow, the uh, at the end of that, he's like, "Well, you got to go back to study hall. There's nothing to do the second semester of school unless you learn an instrument." So I had a couple of weeks to pick up a trumpet, and I came back and played trumpet for the rest of the semester and got my scholarship to go play horn and. I played trumpet and trombone primarily uh, to help out with school when I went there, but I, I decided I really liked that. I and mean, there's a lot music. of people that pl- you you started playing pretty close to the time you went to college to get scholarships, so you obviously picked it up really quickly. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you know, I, part of it, you know, I, obviously there's an aptitude, but there's also I'd had a background at least a little bit. We had. When we were young, there was a, a spate of piano lessons that lasted until the teacher got tired of me kicking the piano while I was sitting at it and that kind of thing. But yeah, it wasn't until high school that I really like developed an interest in playing music of any sort. And uh, like I said, a little bit of, of get, I didn't hear it, uh, <laughs> the, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, messing around with the guitar and then, like I said, with the horn there, 
But I mean, if you, you were good enough, so you got a scholarship. And where did you go? I went over to Martin. To Martin, to UT Martin. Yeah. Okay. And at that point, the that was like, I might as well have gone to Berkeley. You know, that was like way out there. I, uh, not a lot. Of, we grew up in the woods. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally. And uh, uh, so I'd never really traveled anywhere. I never and didn't know much about anything of the outside world. So it was just, you know, if you're going to go to college, you go over there. And uh, that's what I did. And that just kind of started branching out like, oh, there's the world's larger. Oh, and, yeah. You, you know, see, we're exposed to things. Yeah. And that's what's great about UT Martin is they yeah. really do a lot of work, you know, mm-hmm. getting kids overseas and sure. traveling. And, and then, and, you know, I, I don't even know now. Uh, it was really the, the foreign exchange program there was amazing. And they still, I think, sort of ride that. Uh, that sort of history that they built for themselves. They've established themselves so well. They've maintained their really good relationship with so many countries, swapping out students there. Yeah, we exchange is the word they yeah, use, they but ex- we exchanged like the swap, students. Swap yeah. students yeah. yeah, I talked to some not too long ago who yeah. were visiting here who were from uh, China or Japan right. or, you know, somewhere. It was really, they were J- really... Japan was massive exchange program when I was there uh, between Korea, South Korea and Japan. Uh, and now it's uh, a lot more from the Saudi countries. Uh, the the ratios change. I think, if I remember correctly, the 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 king gave some money to anybody that wanted to go study abroad, right. and we were very quick to go here. Right. Yeah. So, now, what what was your major? Music. Okay. And just in general, music. Uh, no, uh, guitar performance. Okay. And then specifically on bass guitar. And then what did you do with that? I uh, went into graphic design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I went, as soon as I graduated, I, I played with uh, a group of people, uh, a group called 27B Stroke 6, uh, our percussionist, Julie Hill, you know, and uh, we all got a place together in, in, near, uh, in Hendersonville, near Nashville. And uh, we just you know, played and did our thing as musicians and that being going to Nashville, suddenly the world got that much bigger again and started getting involved with everything else going on there, uh, other groups, other musicians and, and traveling around with different people. And, but, you know, when you're a musician, that means usually you got to go get a job to pay for your musicianship. So I, I, uh, I started on with my cousin, uh, Laura and Britt, uh, my cousin, Britt was a graphic designer, so I went there to work at his business with him and help out. It just so happens if you're a musician, you also have to learn how to do everything else, which right. is like be your own graphic designer because you can't afford one. And when we lost one of our graphic designers, they said, hey, we heard that you do graphic design as well. Could you help out with that? So I shifted gears from doing like whatever installs I was doing. When in the graphic design world was this. Is this like pre-Mac? Or, so this is Nin- post-Macintosh. The, those were yes, out. Yeah, yeah. And you would sit there and, and you'd really have to just make sure everything was lined up because doing a print would be eight hours to get this large-scale print. You know, today it's just like you hit it and right. there's a big print. But back then you really had to think about, you know, okay, is everything set and, and hopped up the way we want it to be? Do we have all the... The ink's filled up because if we, anything crashes, we're going to have to restart all of this. And, right. and back then, it was this transfer process. I'm sure this is stuff you really want to know about. But, yeah. No, this is know, great. Was, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's we interesting. We would print backwards in yeah. reverse CMYK order and then heat transfer that over to a vinyl substrate mm-hmm. and then laminate but it. But back, back <laughs> even, even I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Right. You know, I mean, the, the uh, technology has changed so oh, yeah. dramatically. Yeah, we had a we had a warehouse where most of our actual fabrication was going on and a few blocks over on 8th Street in uh, Nashville, we had our main office where you if you wanted to buy something you came in there and talked to the salespeople. They would get files at the sales office and we would need them over at the warehouse where we were producing. And today you would just go click send it. Back then, somebody had to drive over there. Mm-hmm carry you a big zip disk. Right. Oh, yeah. No, Because they would hold like 100 gig. I mean, 100 megs. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, I've worked at a place where we had them all lined up. Yeah, yeah. Grab a few, make sure there's nothing on them. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you couldn't keep a lot on the hard drive itself. Yeah. 
You yeah. Know? So yeah. I've got several hard drives that I just can't bear to throw away. Old Apple. <laughs> they're, they're in Give the it. they're in the attic. But yeah, you know, that's, I, you're a yeah, cyber, I need to. You're a cyber hoarder. That's yeah, I right. am. I am. I have a hard time letting. We'll bring I think, them over. We'll transfer them all to one. You know, uh, I've done it. I've yeah. transferred them over. I just still feel like there may be something on nope. that hard drive that I need. Yeah, there yeah. may be, and you'll yeah. never go back. And, and I'll find never out. go back. Right. Yeah. It's in. A st- we pay it for a storage facility. It'll be that last yeah. joke on your kids when yeah. they go through. What is all this stuff? What is this gigantic old timey computer for? So now, at some point or another, you never left music completely behind, right? You mm, s- far from it. Yeah. So at some point, I'm waiting for us to talk about Bocadelic Funky Talk. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Fast forward. The band moves down to Murfreesboro. Uh, we're all getting involved with different, uh, uh, just all different evocations in life. And and uh, the band 27, 27 B-Stroke 6, uh, that we had moved to Nashville with, we put the pause button on and uh, we all were in different Groups And I went out and decided at this point, I'm going to start a group. This my group. I played in other groups for other people or with other people sort of democratically. But this was going to be an autonomous thing. This is what I want to do. And if you want to be in the band, you're going to do what I want to do. And that's that was the approach. But it was called Colossal Head. We had to come up with some way to express what it sounded like. And so... We use Vocadelic Funky Tonk. And, uh, and so elaborate on what exactly is that? Well, it, it just spanned a few different genres. Uh, it was more about the vibe of the group. The The instrumentation at the time was I, at a gig. When I showed up to a gig, my instruments, I would carry a, a banjo, a cavaquinho, a guitar, electric piano, and a Moog synthesizer. And that was fairly standard fare to like have all those sounds together, you know, and the guitarist was also playing mandolin half the time. And so we got uh, a nice texture that was a little bit novel, I guess, for especially what, what was going on around the area. You didn't get to hear all of those instruments typically in the same band. And it was just kind of fun, upbeat stuff. Uh, it, now, so through all that, through everything you did, you um, experienced the world at some point. That's my slice of it, yeah. You've yeah. come back. Right. And so what was the motivation to come back to this well, region? And, you know, you... You could have gone to L.A. or New okay. York or... I'll throw you a curveball. Uh, so I, I'm i still there uh, working graphic design and playing music, and I get a call that back home they're building a museum. Back home being here, Obion County. Right, right. And Mr. Kirkland needed someone to, spoiler alert... It was Discovery Park. Oh, uh, the cat's out of the cat's out of the bag. Yeah, yeah. So Mr. Kirkland needed someone to do 3D modeling, uh, essentially, in order to have conversations on developing Discovery Park. They wanted to be able to make a virtual tour of the facilities prior to going out and dropping a bunch of money and building a thing, uh, lots of time and labor and resources. So we would, uh, I would get uh, architecturals build virtual versions of whatever the building was like that the church there that we got or the building that the the train depot and we would place it and see that oh the dimension sounded good but when you do it in real world it's it's a really narrow patio let's widen that up 16 feet now it's got a little bit more elbow room little things like that and so a number of buildings during meetings we would place them as per specification and then realize that oh this is going to obfuscate your view you know, let's turn this building a little bit, move it here. Well, you know, 3D, it's everyday thing now, but back then it was still a little bit novel to have that sort of... So so I'm curious, so he had an architectural firm that he had hired. Mm -hmm. Surely they had that. Did they not have that, or did he choose to go to his hometown guy? uh, At the time, especially, I don't know how things are now, but uh, you had two aspects of Discovery Park. You had the museum proper. Mm-hmm. And then you had the cortilage, which is all of the grounds around it. And we call that the heritage park. Right. Yes. So uh, you've got all these buildings coming in, and that was not really under the scope of oh. what those people were going to be doing. Didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, and they were focused on museum, how to set up attractions, how to set up booths, and you yeah. know, they all, all the things you when you get into a business, you have to yeah. know how things do. They might have had a general concept of what we. We're doing outside the museum building, 
but by and large, it was a, a, a handful of people sitting in an office building in a little trailer on the yeah. side of the and who were the, who was who was in the do you remember the people so my hierarchy would have been right above me was uh at the time rob uh, uh kingry and right above him was uh polly okay. who's still here yeah and uh and i guess she would have answered directly to mr kirkland mm-hmm. and then uh tangentially there was uh kim cruz was here somewhere in the nearing Orbit was uh, Jennifer Wilds. We would like intersect because she was at a different location and, you know, like shooting emails, like factor this in. I, you know, I honestly don't remember what all yeah. everybody was doing. I just basically came in every day that I was here with uh, s- some spec sheets and sit at a computer and build whatever it was. Or we'd go out to site and look at these buildings before we brought uh, some of these buildings over to the local site, like these log cabins that church, whatever, I would go measure them, build a virtual version of it, plop it down into my virtual world that I'd built that is the Discovery Park. And, that's and then Mr. Kirkland, he would he would make comments and look at right, it. Right, yeah, and, he would have you know, his sheets, you yeah. know, they're built as per his verbal specifications, yeah. and then when he would see it and be like, oh, no, that doesn't work like that. Let's, right. you know, I, oh, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, where the paintings are. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, that's all right. So he, when he originally built it, or, or uh, request design for it, it was much shorter. It was basically a ground floor kind of building. Okay. He's like, well, that, has, that doesn't have the impact, you know? Yeah. It's like, well, let's raise it up. So we're sitting there in, in, in meeting. Everybody's looking at a big screen with my designs as I'm designing right there, and it's like, can we make that four feet taller? Okay, bring it up four feet. Oh, now it's got the visual impact that I want yeah. to have. Let's put a staircase out in front of it and widen it up. Uh, so he was really hands-on. Yeah, yeah. I've had uh, you know, one of my favorite memories of him is him lying in the floor in my office trying to do a, a pose of Prometheus. <laughs> and he's totally in his own world. You could tell he just like miles away. He's like, okay, what I'm thinking is we're going to have this statue and Prometheus is going to be sitting like this and he's going to have his arm up like that. Should he be looking up? Should he be looking? Of course, he's down on the floor the whole time. And then finally, he's just like he had this sudden awareness of like, you know, he cuts his eyes at me. He's like, you seem to have this, I, don't, I wouldn't say self-consciousness about him, but realize how far he'd gone into his own world. And then he stands back up and, you know, we're going to talk about this. And, uh, yeah, so, I, you know. That was uh, that's what it was like dealing with him on a daily basis. So you've you've had um, great creative success on the music side and on the graphic design side. Which do you have a preference on which you like the best? Ah, uh, boy, that's a, a daily question. It changes. With and so that. you cur- so you currently you uh, teach at you know I teach you, over at, at you university. Teach. I teach a recording technologies course uh, primarily for music students, uh, and I teach applied guitar and bass. Uh, what else do I do? And you still you still play I, too, because I see you around town, right? And, and, and know, I'm, I'm performing like the token bass player in here. Uh, we're trying to grow some more, but right now, like uh, every time something's happening and a bass player is needed, uh, I end up playing a gig. So what what is the, is that the benefit? You're obviously being, you're a very creative person, obviously. And so you're living in this rural community where there are probably a little less opportunities to be creative than if you were in maybe LA or New York. You know, it, it, what is the benefit? Why, why stay close to home? Well, I mean, this is where my family is. So, I mean, that's the the long and short of it. You know, this is uh, uh, about the time when I came back, my brother in law went off and bought a nursery <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> And I was spending half of my week here, half my week in Nashville. I had my studio there. Uh, and and he said, well, I've got this place. Maybe we could use your services here uh, between the, doing the, the layouts and design. Because when we go out and do a job, uh, when people come in uh, wanting to get landscaping done, sometimes it's a larger project. They want to see the end result before they get started because, you know, they're – you know, and dropping some money on this, and they want to know that we're all talking about the same thing. Right. And so we started applying that. But my studio was in Nashville, and, and Charles says, well, why don't you bring it here and see how that goes? <laughs> so I did, and, and, you know, it's very different template here, uh, what goes on. And then you had, a, you had, or you may still have, a production studio at the Garden Center right. called so at Bronze. The back of Soleil, Bronze Recording there. Yeah. I've, uh, I've got the 
back portion of that, I've got a 30 by 35 foot tracking room in addition to my mix room, the control room. So a pretty you know, fairly full-fledged uh, multi-track studio, uh, good mic locker and preamps and all that stuff. If you're, you know, if you're into recording, that means something. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, like, whereas in Nashville, it was largely getting these bands coming in, wanting to track their album or whatever, or songwriters. I'm a utility player, so songwriters would come in. I would work with them on arranging songs and then they would just leave me alone in the studio and I would go track out all the parts and make the songs so they could flesh them out and pitch them or whatever they did. So I'd you know, play the drums, play the bass, play the piano, play the let stack up all these instruments, do backing vocals, and they'd come in, sing on it, and do whatever they would do with it. Or, like I said, bands come in. Now, when I came back here, there's a little bit of that, but more of it is people coming in uh, saying, I've got old cassettes and he transferred to digital. Mm. I've yeah. got uh, some old VHS or things of that nature, or I'm going to sing me along with pre-recorded tracks. Yeah. I don't have a band per se. I've just got karaoke tracks. So. And then, and then now you also have a, a little kid, right? That, uh, dose two little kids. Oh yeah. Two yeah, of them. So now, you've so. got, so you've got, you know, more motivation to right. stay close to home where you have built-in right. babysitters. And that's, that's right. That's exactly right. Yes. Uh, so that, as you know, changes every dynamic of, of everything in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, Well, thank you for being here today. I know a lot of people see you all over town on stage because I see everywhere I go, <laughs> if there's a band, I know you're going to we'll be come out tonight. I'll be there. playing Cavaquinho, playing Brazilian short row music over at the Historic Ants. <laughs> I, I will absolutely be there. Thank you. <laughs> And now, let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I am Katie Jarvis, and in the studio today at Discovery Park of America, I've got John Watkins, who is our grounds director here. John, thank you for coming today. Well, you're very welcome. Got me out of the cold for a few minutes. Oh, it is very cold today. So, you are the Christmas guru. You are in charge of the lights and making Discovery Park of America dance and twinkle and dazzle just in time for Christmas. So we want to know the behind the scenes. We want to take a peek behind the curtain and just hear what it takes to put on this great Christmas light show. Well, we're going into, what, our sixth year now. So we have accumulated uh, quite a few lights. We are over a million lights now. I know we hit that mark last year. Uh, so we've gone a little bit over that, but uh, we like to say that we do now actually have over a million lights. And that being said, uh, it takes a while to put those up, to put a million lights up. Uh, we generally start in late September or early October. Uh, you'll see us out there in short pants and short sleeves and burning hot weather. And up until days like today when the high temperature I think the wind chill when I walked in a few minutes ago was eight degrees. Ooh. So it's not too pleasant out, but it's always a great show, and we look forward to it every year. Um, but it's a, it's a work of love, I guess. Mm-hmm. So tell us, you were telling me earlier before we started recording about how many miles of lights or how many miles of extension cords. Well, if we strung all of our lights out, all of our strings together, uh, we have close to now about 12 to 14 miles of lights. Wow. So, yes, we could stretch from uh, Union City to Martin almost and, and make a solid strand of light. <laughs> uh, bigger than that is trying to get electricity to all this. We mm-hmm. don't have electricity throughout a lot of the grounds and, of course, not up in the trees where we put all these lights. Mm-hmm. So we hook together and make our own and, and buy about six miles of extension cords uh, to get electricity to everything. So 20 miles in total. Around. We're around 20 miles in total. <laughs> wow. So it's a real treat for all of our guests that come out each year and drive through the thousands, excuse me, million, mm. over a million lights um, here at Discovery Park and throughout the grounds. And y'all do a great job. How many people do you have on your team that put these lights up? Oh, we've got a pretty diverse crew. My grounds crew, uh, we've probably got four to five people putting up lights, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Our IT department puts together a lot of the synchronized lights, so you'll see a lot of the lights when you drive through are synchronized to our own radio station that we broadcast. So uh, it gives it a little bit extra something to uh, to listen to and be able to hear and see at the same time. 
But our IT department comes up with some fantastic ideas, and they make these things. We'll have dancing hoops. We'll have stars up in the trees. We'll have uh, synchronized uh, light shows on the ground and above up in the air. Wow. And have y'all, I know that y'all um, introduce new things every year. And should we expect that? There's for always the years something. To come? <laughs> uh, absolutely. We try and come up with a few new things. Uh, we uh, rack our brains and, and try and do something that stays current. There's so much technology now that every year it seems like there's something new that comes out. So we'll use a lot of RGB lights that are able to produce uh, an infinite number of colors. Uh, so we may get as many as, what, 256 different colors out of one bulb wow. and you string several thousand of those together you'll have like a million different combinations to go through but we do try and keep up with the technology and and make it interesting things that you won't be able to you know you can't just dig around in your attic and pull out the lights and throw them up outside these are things that you probably won't see anywhere else yeah this year we have built a new tunnel oh yes everyone so, talks about the tunnel uh, the tunnels are so much fun they're set up and synchronized uh, some of them are set up to the music a lot of them uh, produce lights, waves that go back and forth. So as you're driving through, you really have to pay attention to the road. Uh, and I've noticed several cars uh, veering over towards the lights, and it always makes me nervous. But uh, everything tends to work out, and it's a great show. If somebody wanted to start their own Christmas light show, could they do it? Uh, the biggest thing, we use uh, all LED lights, uh, for a number of different reasons, the lights tend to last a lot longer. We're going on six years, and some of our original lights we bought six years ago uh, are still doing great. And you got to figure that we put on the show for a solid month, so it's 30 days and, and of solid lights at night, usually six to eight hours a night. That's quite a few hours to get out of a light bulb, and they tend to hold up very well. They're a little more expensive on the front end, but you get what you pay for. And if you want something that's going to last a long time, LED is definitely the way to go. Worth the investment. Well, John, thank you so much for coming out today to be a part of the Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.